Cool. So yeah, let's briefly recap the things that we discussed last time. So uh, we actually discussed some kind of the very practical the ideas in terms of like how we can also utilize the uh, pre-trained the diffusion the models for some many kind of the applications, especially for some of the cases that we are doing some kind of the conditional degeneration, you know, basically the two shot and the few shot the manners. So what we basically intended to do in this case is that now we can see many kind of the pre-trained uh, the diffusion the models that are basically uh, pre-trained with some kind of the internet scale, the very large scale the data set, like having like 5.8 billions of the image the text pairs, uh, which is not millions, the billions, which is really huge the scale. So the, here the idea is that can you somehow utilize this kind of the some existing the different the models that have been already uh, trained with some very you know, huge scale uh, is some kind of the uh, special the cases that we are basically adapting the pre models for some special cases, especially like when you have some kind of the conditions. Uh, for example, we can consider like making some of the images based on kind of the sketches uh, where we can consider like building some missing regions. Uh, we can do many kinds of things and we can also do those things not only for the images, but also for the audio, like the video or 3D, many things, uh, if we have some kind of the pre-trained uh, the different models for that. So the basic idea that we discussed, like actually we discussed a bunch of kind of things. Uh, the first thing was basically the idea like the SDA did, which is basically nothing but basically just like repeating the full process and the reverse process of it uh, in terms of the like, when you start from some kind of the unrealistic images, like the sketches, uh, we are perturbing the data by you know, running the full process a little bit and then reversing the uh, the process uh, back again to the some of the images in a way that uh, now we can obtain some of the realistic images that are basically close to the, uh, the input, the unrealistic images. So this was kind of the very simple the idea. And also we uh, briefly discussed the idea of the repaint, uh, which is also uh, applying this kind of diffusion models for some kind of the completion the tasks. So we are basically uh, running the you know uh, the denoising steps uh, for some kind of the the foreground uh, regions that we are going to fill in, and also running the no, the full the the perturbation the steps uh, in the background regions that we are going to basically fix. Uh, so by combining these kind of the outputs of the two steps, we are basically uh, making some of the realistic images while basically preserving some of the regions that we want to uh, the fix. So this was kind of also very uh, the practical the ideas in terms of like how we can. Uh, use the pre-trained diffusion models for the editing and the, the completion. And also what we could see in those kind of the cases was that those are basically some of the examples that we are uh, using some kind of the diffusion models uh, and also doing some kind of the manipulation in the pixel space. And we also discussed some kind of the two different ideas in terms of like uh, running the diffusion models with the different representations. Like one is basically using some kind of the latent representation in a way that we can basically decrease uh, the dimension of the uh, the of the data in a way that we can more efficiently train the different the models while also achieving the best quality. Uh, but for those kind of the cases, uh, we cannot do this kind of the some composition, right? So these are basically some of the examples that we are doing some kind of the composition of the background region and the foreground region at each step of the reverse the process. Uh, for those kind of the cases, uh, we cannot basically use some kind of the latent representation. Uh, so this is kind of the drawback in terms of using the uh, written representation in terms of that uh, we can basically achieve some kind of the best quality uh, in the uh, degeneration. But if you want to apply this kind of the uh, some the diffusion models for some kind of the conditional the cases, uh, we cannot directly use the unconditional diffusion models, but basically we need to retrain uh, another the conditional the diffusion the, the, the models uh, for each of these specific the setups. But the good thing of like having some kind of the more explicit representation, like the pixel representation for the images, uh, is that we may not be able to get the best performance in terms of the quality of the outputs because of the high dimensionality of the input data. And also we cannot change the resolution of the data. So those are kind of like big the, the drawbacks. Uh, but the thing is that uh, it becomes much easier to apply this kind of the unconditional different models for some kind of the uh, conditional the cases in terms of that. Uh, we can do some kind of the manipulation uh, for each of the uh, the intermediate the outputs uh, of the reverse the process uh, in the pixel space. So those are kind of the pros and the cons, uh, like using some uh, different representations. And as you can see, like what we are discussing over the entire of this the course is basically uh, what the kind of the good thing and the bad things for each of the representation, also for the 3D case. 
Uh, so we're going to also briefly go into that uh, in the, the later this slides. And also some other kind of the idea was basically in how we can also do some kind of the guided, uh, run some kind of the guided reverse the process in terms of that if we actually uh, see the, the reverse process uh, for each of the, the transition, what we are doing is that uh, given the noisy the data, the XT, we are basically somehow you know, predicting uh, the final the output, the X0, uh, based on the, uh, the noise prediction that we are doing uh, for each of the time step, the, the T here. And based on the X0 here, uh, the, for the prediction of the X0, we are basically, uh, you know, the sampling the XT minus one, uh, basically uh, taking, computing the mean of the Gaussian the distribution and basically sampling the, uh, the unique Gaussian the noise Z here. And based on that, we are basically getting the XT minus one. So basically for the computation of the sampling of the XT minus one, uh, what we need to have is that not, we are not having the XT, but also we are getting some kind of the prediction of the final, the output, the X0. And based on these uh, uh, two, and also the unique Gaussian, the, uh, the sample, we are basically sampling the XT minus one. Uh, so this was kind of the basic, the, the procedure of the reverse transition, the uh, different the models. And based on this, you know, what we also could do was that uh, since we are getting some kind of the prediction of the X0 at each step, uh, we can basically somehow uh, run the back propagation uh, for the XT uh, based on some kind of loss function, some kind of the objective the function that we are defining uh, with, with the, the final the output, the prediction of the final the output, the X0, uh, in a way that we can basically guide the reverse the process uh, in terms of like updating the XT uh, in the intermediate step. So this was kind of the basic idea for the uh, guided uh, the reverse the process. So what we can do, for example, here is that like one of the example is that if you, uh, actually I didn't prepare the slides for that, but we can consider some of the examples like we are making some kind of the uh, texture for the 3D the objects. So let's think about some of the examples like we are having some kind of the, some, you know, some row D3D the the geometry. Uh, I just wanted to draw some kind of the human body, uh, yeah. We're like we are having some kind of the mesh without any kind of the appearance information, and we want to add some kind of the color information over the three D mesh, for example, uh, by adding some kind of the uh, the the projective texture. So, for example, like we basically uh, render the three D object into the multiple D views, and then we're gonna have some kind of a silhouette, right? Uh, so, based on the silhouette of the three D object, we are we can consider making some of the generating some of the 2D images that are basically aligned with the, the 2D image, right? The silhouette. And then we can project this back to the 3D object uh, in terms of like making the texture over the 3D shapes. So this is kind of like one of the examples that we can do uh, by using some kind of pre-trained uh, the 2D different models. Uh, it is clear, like we can consider like having a, some kind of the raw 3D object here. And then we want to basically add the color information for the 3D objects. Then some kind of simple things that we can do is that we render this 3D object into the multiple D views, uh, like this. And then for each of the images, we're gonna get some kind of the some silhouette or some kind of the uh, some some well, the depth information for each of the, the 3D objects. Then we can somehow convert this kind of silhouette image into some realistic image, right? Uh, for that, what can you use? Uh, do you, can you imagine like what sort of the different model, the technique that we can use for those kind of the cases? Like for example, if we have the, some mask or the silhouette in the 2D space, and if we want to basically generate some kind of the, uh, some realistic the 2D images that are basically aligned with the, uh, the given the silhouette or the mask, what would be kind of things that we can apply? Question one. No idea. Actually, yeah, we, we, yeah. Some in painting, yeah. Actually, we discussed the idea of the control lab uh, last time, uh, which was also making some kind of the conditional, uh, some generated models by converting uh, the unconditional model into the conditional models. Yeah, we're gonna get into that point. So we can consider like using some kind of a control lab kind of the diffusion models that is basically can convert some kind of the silhouette images or the, some depth images into the uh, realistic the color images, right? 
And so once we basically make some kind of the color images for each of the view, we can consider basically projecting those back to the 3D shapes in terms of like making some of the, some textures over the 3D shapes. Then we might want to add some kind of the, some constraint in terms of that, that like when you make some images from the view A and the image from the view B, when you basically combine all the things over the 3D shapes, we want to basically see the outputs that we are basically seamlessly basically uh, connecting these two images, right? Not making any kind of the boundaries or some kind of the discrepancy uh, between these two images. Uh, for those kind of the cases, we can consider basically add, adding some kind of the uh, guidance in the loss function here in a way that the output images from the view A and the, the output from the view B can be consistent after basically applying uh, the, the projection to the, the 3D the models uh, so we, you know, to make some kind of the texture. So those kind of the constraints can be somehow uh, the uh, model, there's some kind of the loss function, some of the objective function uh, in a way to basically minimize the difference of the images from the view A and the view B. And that we can basically apply this kind of loss function uh, in the guided the reverse the process in a way to get some kind of the consistent uh, the, the textures that we are getting. So you can actually con uh, think about like so many applications of so the this guided uh, the reverse state process. And there are also the tones of the applications of this. Uh, some of the example would be basically making some of the, uh, some consistent the panorama the images. And this is actually the research that we have done. Uh, so this is also the cases that we are making some of the, uh, this style of the consistency across the kind of the multiple the frames uh, across the, the, the entire, the, the wrong the panorama the images. And you can also achieve this kind of the uh, consistency across the frames in the video as well. And this is also kind of the example, like making some kind of the video uh, editing. Let me replay this. Yeah. So this is this is kind of the, the example that we are basically editing some of the, uh, the given the video in some certain style. And we are basically achieving some kind of the, the style of the consistency across the, all the frames in the video uh, in a way to basically add some kind of the, some regularization the loss uh, in the reverse the process. And we can also consider lots of the kind of the applications uh, in terms of like utilizing this kind of the, some guided the reverse the process for the many downstream the applications. So those are some of the ideas. Uh, and also, uh, as we also briefly discussed, uh, we also can uh, consider some of the ideas of the control net. So control net was basically the cases of like not the zero shot kind of case, but when you have some kind of the new the input and the output the pairs of the images, uh, making some of the conditional the setup, how can we basically efficiently fine tune some of the unconditional the pre-trained efficient the models uh, in a way to uh, make it to be adapted into some specific uh, these conditional the scenarios. So for example, like when you have the stable diffusion, uh, which is trained with the you know, more than 5 billion of the images, uh, we can consider you know, making that to be basically adapted into the, for example, like sketch the color image generation the setup. So as you can see, uh, we are having this this kind of the sketch. Actually, this is the edge map. Uh, so we're having this kind of the, some sort of edge map the input, and we want to generate some of the images, the color images, that are basically uh, you know, some realistic the images and also uh, clearly basically aligned with the input the sketch. So how we can do this kind of the, some conditional degeneration uh, when you have some very small the number of the input and the output the pairs, for example, like less than uh, fifty thousand. So compared to the more than the five billions of the images, like you know, less than the fifty thousand, is like very a uh, small amount of the the input and the output the pairs. And here the question is that how we can basically do this kind of the uh, some conditional degeneration, especially when the input the condition is is given as the image, not the other the text or audio or some other things. Uh, when the condition is the image, how we can uh, efficiently convert some of the unconditional diffusion models uh, into the conditional the cases with the small set of the input and the output pairs. Uh, for those kind of the cases, uh, the idea of the control net was basically fully ut utilizing the all the pre-trained the parameters of the noise prediction the network in the new net uh, in terms of basically also the processing the conditional the image the, uh, the, the data as well. So for that, basically we, we also briefly uh, the discussed the idea of the zero convolution. 
uh, in a way that we are basically copying all the kind of the neural net parameters of uh, the noise the prediction of the network in the unit. And they also applying the geoconvolution in a way that at the very beginning of the training, we are starting from the outputs uh, that becomes exactly the same with the unconditional case. So what we have seen the previous the, the, the time is that you know, at the very beginning, we are basically initializing all the layers in a way that these parts just become zero. Uh, becoming nothing in terms of that we are starting from the uh, the, the stage that you no know, uh, the neural net becomes the unconditional case at the very beginning and then we are basically incrementally basically adding some kind of the uh, input from the conditional case in a way that we are basically uh, you know slowly basically adapting the unconditional models into the conditional cases uh, in terms of like getting the uh, conditional the input the, the information. So this was basically the basic idea for the control net. And you can also check out some of the more the details uh, in the paper. So let me just quickly skip this kind of things. And basically this idea also can be used in the many kind of the conditional the cases uh, when the, the conditional the data is basically uh, image. Uh, basically when the conditional the data and also the outputs are basically same type of the data, uh, like images or 3D, whatever kind of things, then we can basically apply the same the zero convolution the idea uh, in terms of basically uh, processing both the uh, the conditional the data and also the noisy data in the reverse the process using the same kind of the neural net the architecture. Uh, so that's the basic idea. So those are all the different the applications in terms of like taking sketch, normal map, depth map, edge map, whatever kind of things as kind of the conditional the input and generating some kind of the realistic the images. And also the things that we didn't discuss last time was basically the idea of the LoRa. I guess this might be also very, uh, this is basically very famous the technique. And I guess you, most, some of you might uh, hear about this before. Um, the basic idea for the LoRa is basically also how we can also kind of like personalize uh, the pre-trained uh, the diffusion the models uh, with some kind of the few shot the training. So here, what we basically mean is that uh, we are basically adapting the pre-trained the diffusion model for some specific the domain of the data or some specific the style of the images in this case, uh, in a way that we can get some kind of the stylized the outputs, which is basically having the same style or same the content uh, for give with some kind of the given some very small the amount of the training data. So this is basically very famous the technique, which is already basically being used in the many the design process, as you can see, like you know, you are basically adapting the pre-trained model uh, in order to make this style of the, the portrait of the woman, then we can get this kind of the, some portrait images. And we can, we can also adapt uh, the pre-trained model in a way to basically generate some kind of the interior design that we can also get this kind of the images and so on. So we can obviously apply this kind of techniques for the cartoon generation, for example, and we're gonna uh, be able to see some kind of the many kind of cartoon images. So this is kind of like very the common the technique these days in terms of like personalizing some kind of the many kind of the large scale uh, some kind of pre-trained neural network not only for the different models actually this idea uh, came from the large the language models not only just for the different models so the basic idea is that in terms of like when you have some kind of the uh, the giant the neural network which was trained with some kind of the uh, lots of kind of the training data. Uh, we are basically making a small kind of the uh, sort of the offset the neural network uh, in a way that uh, now the, the network can be represented as kind of like having the original the neural net, uh, which is the fixed. So we are not basically fine tuning the, the parameters of the given the neural network, but actually we are adding some kind of a small the neural net, uh, which output is basically the added uh, to the output of the existing the neural net. So we are basically making some kind of the adding some kind of the small amount of the new the parameters uh, of the neural network in a way that we can easily basically uh, fine tune the much smaller number of the parameters to also be some kind of the uh, much smaller number of the training data. And the basic, the simple, the idea in terms of like reducing the number of the parameters uh, for the neural network is basically making, uh, the, representing the, the, new, the new set of the parameters, the additional the neural network as kind of the some, you know, multiplication of the two uh, row rank the matrices. So we are basically having the this kind of the two row rank the matrices and the neural net the parameters are now represented as the multiplication of like these two uh, the row length the matrices. So this is also kind of similar with the idea uh, that we have discussed in the tensor the RFD case. Basically having some kind of the row rank the decomposition 
Uh, so in terms of having this kind of the two small kind of the uh, thin neural networks and representing the parameters of the old neural net as kind of the multiplication like these two, uh, we can efficiently reduce the number of the neural net parameters and also fine tune, uh, you know, update, you know, train this kind of the, the small amount of the parameters also with the small amount of the training data. So this was also kind of the very the practical the idea in terms of like we are doing some kind of the uh, adaptation uh, of some kind of the uh, the diffusion model into the small the specific the domain of the data. And if you go into this kind of the website, then you can also see lots of some kind of the interesting the LoRa models. Uh, those are all the cases that people just try to basically fine tune uh, the stable diffusion into some small amount of the set of the some specific style of the images in terms of, of like making some kind of the specialized uh, the image generated models. So those are basically uh, interesting some kind of the, the low the models that you can actually easily download in some kind of the public uh, the repositories. So this is like the basic idea in terms of like how we can utilize uh, diffusion models, uh, some many kind of the, some the applications. So I just quickly went through the all the ideas, but do you have any questions on this? So if you have any questions or some more details, uh, please let me know. Uh, please post the questions on this slide, uh, even after the lectures. Uh, but let's quickly go over the 3D generation. Actually, the reason that why we started to discuss the diffusion model is actually about like how we can also apply this idea for some kind of the 3D generation. And actually, there are lots of the work like applying the diffusion models for the 3D generation, and these are obviously very new the techniques that basically have emerged in the last of the couple of years. And we also start to see some kind of examples of like making some 3D generated models using the different models. So you can see some of the kind of the very uh, recent examples. If you see some papers, like you know, there are some of the cases like applying different models into the point clouds and also applying different models into some kind of voxel representations. When you have some kind of the occupancy field or the sign distance function in the some voxels, we can also apply different models for the, uh, the voxel representation. And obviously we can also consider making like different models, which is basically running over the latent space. So there will be some kind of the attempts to basically apply the exact same idea of the like latent different models for the 3D case as well. And also there have been some kind of interesting the ideas like applying the different models for the triplane representation, basically the tensor RF, the representation having the 3D points uh, for the 3D space. And even there are some kind of different models that are basically applying this idea uh, in this spectral domain. So basically converting all the 3D formation into the um, you know, spectral domain using the 3 d analysis and applying the different models there. So you can basically yeah, check into this kind of some interesting the recent work of applying different models into the many different 3D representations. And also what we can see is that we are having some kind of the same the pros and the cons in terms of like if we apply different models into some kind of the explicit the representation, uh, the thing is that we cannot change the resolution. And also we may get some kind of the suboptimal the quality in terms of that the dimensionality might be too high. Uh, but the good thing is that we can apply this kind of diffusion models for some many kind of the some conditional the cases within you know, the zero shot and the few shot the uh, the uh, kind of the the training. So the same pros and the cons. And if we also apply different models in the latent space, the thing is that we cannot directly apply the unconditional diffusion model for some conditional the cases. Uh, but we might be able to get some kind of better quality. So there are also some kind of the same the pros and the cons. And this is also the our research that we have done uh, in this year in terms of how we can also deal with some kind of the hybrid representation in terms of like uh, taking the benefit of the uh, both of the explicit and some kind of the latent some uh, the implicit the, the representations uh, in terms of like having some global structure representation you know like the more explicit way having some of the parts and then basically representing some details of the each of the part in you know, like implicit way. Uh, in a way that we can basically get some kind of the very high quality of the outputs, uh, as you can see, and also while applying some kind of the same uh, the idea, like applying the uh, different models some some kind of the conditional the cases uh, in terms of basically making some of the applications. So those are some of the so examples that, uh, as you can see, what uh, the like we can basically uh, consider like combining the parts uh, in the different 3D models uh, by applying the SDA idea. 
So this is basically nothing but basically applying the SD edit idea in terms of like you are taking some of the parts from the shape A and also the other parts from the shape B, then you're gonna get this kind of the a little bit the unrealistic the composition of the parts. Then what we can do is that uh, the best way to basically small project this kind of the unrealistic the 3D object uh, into the realistic the 3D object is basically just like applying the some the forward process and the reverse process a little bit uh, using the SD edit the idea in terms of like making some kind of the more realistic the shapes. And also you can apply some kind of the uh, idea of the repaint in terms of like completing some of the missing the parts. So this is also the example like we are using the exactly the same the repaint the idea uh, in terms of like filling some kind of the missing parts uh, for the 3D shapes. And this is doable because we are also using some kind of the explicit the representation, the part level representation. So if, if, if everything is basically some kind of the latent representation, then we cannot do this kind of the uh, some part level the editing uh, using the different the models. So those are also kind of the uh, pros and the cons in terms of like using some kind of the different representations. So those are some of the examples that we are using the different models in the 3D case. But what would be kind of the issues here is that uh, basically one kind of issue in terms of like 3D generation is like how we can also collect the large scale of the 3D data set. As we also have discussed in the previous slide uh, for the images, now we can see like very huge the internet scale of kind of the public, even the public the data set, like more than 5 billion. So here the question is that how many kinds of 3D, uh, the object the data set that we can, of uh, the 3D objects that we can see in many kinds of the, the, the data sets? What's the scale of the 3D data set? So the thing is that obviously the scale of the 3D data set uh, keeps increasing in a very like the you know fast speed uh, in terms of the like the shape net that you might have seen in the, the previous assignment uh, was the case that we are having the less than like 50,000 kind of the shapes. And recently we started to, started to see some kind of the much larger scale of the data set. Uh, this observers is kind of the famous data set uh, that introduced uh, the much bigger data set uh, last year, which was basically including 800,000 uh, 3D models, so which is quite big. But still compared to the 5 billion, it's way, way smaller the number of 3D objects, right? But as you can see, actually the speed of like basically you know, growing the scale, the scale of the data set is really, really fast. Uh, so in this summer, like sometime June or something, uh, also the, the Observers the team basically, you know, uh, scaled up the data set in terms of like an increasing scale up to now 10 million. So as you can see, like this, this, the scale is basically exponentially basically growing into some kind of the much bigger size. Uh, so I don't know, maybe in some kind of near future, we're gonna really see some kind of the very large scale of the 3D data set, but still like compared to the 5 billion, like 10 million is actually much smaller the data set. And I'm not sure you know, whether we can really make some kind of the uh, very huge the scale of the three data set in terms of that the uh, the 3D models in the data set you can really cover all the possible kind of the 3D contents that we're gonna uh, make. So that's kind of the some uh, the things. So probably in some near the future, uh, we might be able to really say some kind of the really big uh, the data set. Probably compared to the image data set, the skill data the skill of the data set may not be still that big. So actually, uh, the reason that why we could see some kind of the big success of like making the diffusion model, image diffusion model, uh, was because of like having this kind of the large scale the two D data set. Uh, so if we cannot make this kind of the large scale the three D data set, then the quality of the three D models that we can achieve may not be quite limited. So that is kind of the issue in this three D generation. So actually, that's why actually we can consider uh, utilizing not only the three D data set but also the 2D data set as well in terms of the 3D generation. So if we actually go back to the things that we are discussing with the NERP, uh, the, the pipeline uh, for the zero shot NERP. So these are some of the examples in terms of like we are utilizing the clip, uh, the, the pre-trained models in terms of like running the NERP without having any images. So here, the, this was basically example that we are basically providing some kind of the guidance for the realistic images for each of the view uh, using the pre-trained clip model, uh, basically doing some kind of the 3D reconstruction, but without any images, but using some kind of the prior knowledge, which is learned from the clip model. And the question that we had last time is that uh, if we have some kind of the good 
the genetic models for the 2D images, can you somehow, you know, you utilize some kind of the prior the knowledge uh, about some kind of realistic images uh, learned from the 2D definitive models to basically generate some kind of 3D objects. So that was the idea that we were discussing about like two weeks ago. So now we are getting back to that point in terms of like when you have some kind of the you know, pre-trained 2D different models, which is basically trained with the more than 5 billion of the, the images, can you utilize this kind of the prior knowledge about the realistic 2D images uh, learned by the different models uh, in terms of making some high quality, some 3D outputs. In terms of that, when you render the 3D object into the multiple views, the rendered images become some kind of realistic images. So this is kind of the, the very recent ideas in terms of like how can you uh, best utilize all the kind of the, some 2D image information in terms of like doing some 3D generation, especially when we cannot have some kind of the uh, very large scale, some kind of the 3D data set. So that was the kind of the, the main idea in terms of like how we combine the 2D information and it also the, we can also consider like combining the 3D information in terms of like doing some 3D generation. And also here, the key thing is that uh, we are having the diffusion the models that can just like produce the 2D images. Uh, but here, you know, how we can utilize this idea for the 3D generation. So for that, we're going to basically briefly discuss the idea of this core distillation sampling, uh, which was basically very recent work actually introduced in this year, uh, which is basically using some kind of the pre-trained image diffusion models for the 3D generation. But as you can see, but this is basically nothing but we are actually running the NERD pipeline. So for uh, each of the view, we are basically running the NERP in a way that basically we can get some kind of the, uh, the you know, the, the opacity and the, uh, the radius the information. So you can ignore some kind of the, some details in terms of what sort of information that we get. Uh, but basically what we can see in this part is basically just training the NERP uh, in terms of like getting some kind of the, uh, the opacity and the radius information for each of the point. You can consider this, it can be just like the just simple the NERP pipeline that we have seen. So what we want to do is that we are basically rendering this kind of the, the NERP the reconstruction uh, into the multiple reviews. And we want to have some kind of the discriminator, uh, which is checking uh, whether the rendered images is realistic or not. So we are basically giving this kind of the guidance in terms of when you render the NERP the output into the multiple the images, uh, for each of the images, we are basically giving the guidance in terms of like whether the images are realistic or not. So if the images are not realistic, uh, we are giving some kind of the penalty in terms of running the path propagation uh, in order to basically update uh, the NERP, the outputs from the, uh, the information from the discrimination. Uh, is this clear? So here the key is basically when you have this do some kind of the NERP reconstruction uh, for the some, some from the multiple debuts, how we can basically measure how realistic each of the real the rendered images. So if we can somehow measure the some of the degree of the the realism or the degree of the plausibility of the rendered images, uh, we can define some kind of the loss function and we run the back propagation from the rendered images uh, all the way back to the 3D objects, the NERP reconstruction. So that's the basic idea. So here the key thing is that using the pre-trained uh, image diffusion models, basically how we can define some kind of the loss function uh, that is basically giving some kind of the measure of the plausibility of the rendered images. So for that, the very basic idea is that you know, if we go back to the, uh, the diffusion model in terms of how we train the diffusion the model, the way that we are training the diffusion model is that, as you can see here, uh, we are starting from some kind of the realistic the, the image the samples, adding some noise, right? With some kind of the randomly sampled the time step t. And then basically checking whether the noise predictor uh, can basically predict the noise that we added uh, for each of the, uh, the realistic images. So this basically means that if the noise the predictor, uh, this, sorry, this network, has been converged uh, in terms of like minimizing this kind of the loss, then when you basically have some kind of the realistic images here, uh, we should be able to get some kind of very small kind of the number, basically minimizing this loss. Uh, so basically, which means that uh, if the input the image, the X0 is the realistic image, then this uh, the, the difference between the, the noise that we are adding 
and to also denotes the predicted by denotes the, the prediction the network uh, should be minimized, right? Uh, this difference should be close to zero. So we are basically directly using the rows function of the different models as kind of the objective function in the like measuring the uh, the realism of the rendered images. So this is a good, like very simple the idea. So we are basically directly feeding the rendered images here, uh, treating them as kind of the realistic images, sampling the time t, and then also the uh, the noise that we are going to add, and making the noise in the part of data xt, right? And based on that, we are predicting the noise using the noise the prediction the network and checking whether the noise that we are adding uh, is the same as the the, the noise prediction the network was the, in predicting, right? Uh, using the same loss function of the different models in terms of like checking uh, whether the data is basically uh, the input, the image is basically realistic or not, while assuming that the network is already trained in terms of like minimizing this loss function, right? So this is basically kind of like very simple, the idea. And obviously, you no, know, I'm not sure whether this is the best way to utilize different models for those kind of the cases. But this is basically kind of like one simple the idea that we can really consider. And it has been uh, like demonstrated as kind of like very effective the idea in many kind of the applications that we can see. So the very basic idea here is that we are, uh, so if we go like step by step, uh, let's say like we are having the NERP representation. Like let's say like all the kind of the NERP, the, the neural net parameter uh, is represented as the pi. So basically we're gonna have some kind of the NLP network, uh, which is basically giving the opacity and the radius values for each of the points, right? So what we uh, do is that we are rendering the NERP representation into the, some multiple reviews. So let's say this is kind of like rendering into the one specific view. So G is kind of the rendering function, given the NERP, the neural net the parameters. So we are getting some kind of the image from this specific view, right? And that image is the x0 here. And when what we do is that we are basically uh, just following the exactly same the training the procedure of the diffusion the models in terms like, uh, sorry. yeah, we are adding the, now the noise, uh, the epsilon t here, uh, with some kind of the randomly sample the time step t, right? Given any kind of the image, we are basically adding the noise and making this some kind of part of the either the xt. Then if this image is like very realistic the image, and also if the diffusion model, the noise prediction, the, the UNET was trained in a way to basically, uh, you know, basically has converged uh, into give some kind of the correct the, the, the noise, then, then what we can expect to see is that uh, when you basically uh, feed, uh, yeah, uh, basically this basically XT into the noise prediction the network, uh, basically having this XT, T, uh, this should be basically the same with the, basically the amount of the noise that we are adding, right? So this should be minimized. Uh, so this becomes our kind of the objective function and we are running the back propagation uh, through the, the loss function here and also through all the way to the kind of the, uh, the X0, which is the rendered images. And actually we are running the back propagation all the way through the NERP the parameters in a way that uh, because XZ is also the output of the rendering, right? So we can run the back propagation all the way down to the, you know, the, the NERP the parameters in a way that we can now the update uh, the NERP representation. So this is basically what we are going to do. Uh, and this is the simple the idea, which is called this core distillation sampling. So what we do is that we're basically calculating this gradient descent. Uh, yeah. So basically we are running uh, the gradient descent in the way to basically minimize this. And if you basically uh, you know, see the chain rule here, then we can basically see that this gradient, uh, the, the competition becomes like decomposed into this form, right? So what is the meaning of like each of the term? Uh, what's the meaning of the first term here, uh, this one? Uh, this is the question two. So basically here the epsilon t is the noise, the amount of the noise that we added. And the this one is basically our the 
noise de prediction de network. So basically, this is basically meaning the difference between the noise that we added and also the noise de predicted by the, by the you know, network, right? So this is basically nothing but basically applying the chain rule. Basically, when you take the gradient descent of this loss function, then how we you know, can compute the gradient using the chain rule, then we're gonna basically get this kind of the uh, decomposition that what you can see is that the first term is about basically difference between these two, the amount of the noise and the noise that we predicted. And this is basically the gradient of the noise prediction the network uh, with respect to the XT, uh, which is the part of the data, right? And then this is also, uh, Uh, my pen is not working, but the last term here, uh, let me actually just go over into the, uh, this way. So this is the noise re residual, basically the difference between the noise that we are predicting and the noise that we are adding. And this is basically the gradient of the noise prediction the network with respect to the XT. And then we, we, we can also take the gradient uh, from the XT to the X0, then we are getting some kind of constant term. And then we, are, we can also get the gradient uh, with respect to the, the nerve representation, uh, no, sorry, the rendering of the nerve representation with respect to the nerve deprimeters. So basically having the uh, decomposition through the chain rule, right? So we're having this kind of the three terms that basically by computing all this kind of the, uh, the components, we can now compute the gradient of the final the terms and the run the gradient descent. And practically what people do is that uh, to reduce the computation time, uh, what people do is that uh, people typically just drop uh, this term. So not computing the gradient of the noise the prediction the network, uh, just like multiplying the other terms in a way to best compute the gradient. Uh, this sounds a little bit like weird, uh, which is true. Uh, and the only reason that we are basically taking out this kind of the, the noise the prediction the Jacobian, this gradient, is just to reduce the computation the time. But this is like very engineering kind of the hacky way in terms of like reduce the computation the time. But the basic idea here is, is basically uh, running the gradient descent in terms of like minimizing this kind of the uh, the, the noise difference. But you no, know, you know, practically people just like drop this term. Uh, but actually, uh, actually you can see that like dropping this term does not making any kind of the big difference in the output of the data. So these are some of the examples that you know we are uh, running the kind of the uh, the you know, the dream fusion the pipeline running the nerve reconstruction with the SDS uh, without the Jacobian term by just dropping the terms. And this is the output when you basically run the SDS with, with that Jacobian term. So as you can see, actually there's no meaningful difference. So this is the uh, case that when you run the gradient descent without the uh, the noise, the prediction then drop the Jacobian data. And this is the results when you run the uh, the same DSDS with the Jacobian term. So this is the, the original the kind of the, the gradient descent without any kind of the modification. So as you can see, actually there is no any kind of the big difference. Any questions on this? Yeah, so actually the only reason that we are dropping the Jacobian term is basically to reduce the competition time because like the noise prediction the network is kind of the big unit. So if we run the back propagation uh, all the way down to the all the, the parameters of the unit, uh, it might basically take some time. Uh, so, and also the loss of the memory as well. So if you basically uh, you know, have some kind of Jacobian term, actually it takes like uh, twice uh, the bigger the, the memory in the, the GPU. So this kind of the so engineering details uh, in terms of like running the things. But actually the idea is kind of like pretty simple, right? So basically what we do is that we are just running the same, the NERP kind of the pipeline, uh, but we are not having the images. So in the NERP pipeline, we have some kind of the images for each of the view. And basically we trained uh, the neural network in terms of like minimizing the photometric loss between the rendered images and the images that we have. But instead of like using that loss, now we are basically using the loss function of the diffusivity models, uh, perturbing the rendered images and predicting the, the amount of the noise that we added and minimizing these two uh, in a way to basically run the back propagation. So this is the only difference. And it's kind of like surprising that uh, making this kind of the, some small difference is actually really converting the neural pipeline into the, some 3D generation the pipeline. 
Any questions on this? So yeah, the some of the questions that we have here might be is that uh, sorry, the question here is that does this mean that noise prediction in the unit is not efficient? Well, I mean it's kind of the some it's not that small the network, it's kind of the, the big unit. Uh, and also like computing the Jacobian over the unit will basically take some kind of the GPU the memories. So that's why becomes like people just try to make it like more efficient by dropping the Jacobian term. But as you have seen the, the slides, actually the dropping the term is not making any kind of the big difference in the final the outputs, but it might affect uh, some, you know, into your some computation, the resources in terms of like taking some more memory in the GPUs or something. So it's more like some engineering the tricks in terms of like getting some kind of the resource in like in an efficient way. But in high level, basically, you know, this is kind of the main thing. Uh, here, the main idea is basically that you can use the training, uh, the procedure of the diffusion models with the pre-trained models in terms of like uh, running the, the, the NERD pipeline for the 3D generation. Does this answer your question? So yeah, actually, and you, know, you might basically also like ask like why this is called the you know school score distillation the sampling. So what's the meaning of like this is that as we also we have seen the uh, the previous the, the lectures basically the the things that we are predicting using the neural network is basically a score right. Uh, so this the noise is basically related to the, the score the function that we are basically uh, running for the reverse the process. So we are basically predicting the score using the prediction the network, and this distillation basically mean comes from the fact that we are basically utilizing some kind of the some prior the information which is learned by the image diffusivity models. So now we are assuming that the image diffusivity models now learn some kind of the some you know some sort of the prior knowledge about like what's the some realistic some plausible the images that we want to see so we are basically distilling this kind of the learned the knowledge from the pre the, the image diffusivity models in terms of like uh, making some 3d objects that can be rendered into the some realistic images so that's why basically having some distillation he, uh, here and also the thing is that uh, instead of like using the typical the reverse process that we are sampling from the unique Gaussian and running some kind of the reverse the, the transition, uh, we are kind of like sampling the output, the three D shapes, in a way to basically iteratively applying the gradient descent uh, from the random the the, uh, the viewpoints. So that's kind of some sort of the another way that we can kind of like sample some of the interesting the outputs, uh, not basically sampling from the unique Gaussian and running the reverse process. But you know, starting from some kind of a random the initialization and then basically running the uh the gradient descent uh iteratively uh in terms of making some more realistic the outputs. So that's why this is called this core distillation the sampling. Question here is that if dropping the term doesn't affect the resource, I thought that it means that only the no rendering is the means for. Well, yeah, so I think you no, know, you can actually play with that. So I'm also gonna uh, show like you know, how you can just also play with the, the real code. Uh, so you can see whether like dropping the Jacobian is really uh, uh, meaningful or not uh, by just training in yourself. Yes, let's maintain the view coherency. I wonder why this could be. Yeah, it, it, this is a good question. So actually the NERP trained with the SDS has some kind of the good sort of the view coherency uh, because uh, we are not just like updating the images, we are updating the whole the NERP the parameters, right? So every time like when you run the back propagation for each view, we are updating not only the image from that view, but we are running the back propagation all the way down to the, the 3D representation. So it really like the gradient descent from the each specific view is really updating the whole the 3D objects. So this is actually kind of the key thing. So if we basically only updated each of the view and then just like you know, ran the NERP uh, with some kind of some updated images, then we will not get some kind of the very spaghetti kind of the output in terms of like having all different the kind of images from different views and then the reconstruction will be basically some kind of random things, right? But since we are updating the 3D entire the 3D objects from the each of the view in a kind of the iterative way, uh, we are not breaking the entire the 3D shapes, but we are basically getting some kind of the some consistent the outputs from the all the views uh, because like uh, the, the back propagation is basically affecting the, the entire the 3D objects uh, even in each of the view. So that's kind of the interesting things. So you know, having the NERP representation and also running the backprop through the three D uh, is basically helping us to get some kind of the more like more the coherent outputs from the multiple reviews. 
but this answer your question clear and also the very quick uh, interesting thing is that uh, actually you might ask also the question like why we do not use some kind of the sorry uh, the reverse the process for the diffusion the models the basically you know uh, some you know the standard way to basically make some kind of the uh, realistic the outputs would be obviously like running the reverse diffusion the process but instead of like running the reverse the diffusion the process what we do is that we are basically uh, you know uh, running some kind of the optimization is some kind of the the objective function uh, in the training time so that's kind of like different way that we are making some kind of the realistic the outputs and the reason for that is that because we just do not want to generate some kind of the realistic images for each of the view. But as I said, we want to actually update the entire the NERP the prom the prompters uh, through the kind of the uh, optimization. So that's kind of thing. So here basically the things that we want to generate is not basically the images, but actually the NERP the reconstruction, right? And all the images that we are having are basically prompterized with some kind of the per pixel the colors but with some kind of the NERP the parameters, right? Uh, so there can be like two different ways. We can basically represent the images with some kind of per pixel the colors. And that's the way that we are typically representing images. And the images that are used for the training of the DPGD models uh, were also represented with the per pixel the colors. But now we are switching the way to represent the images. Now all the images are basically represented as kind of the rendering of the NERP reconstruction, right? So now the representation of the images has been changed. So that's why we cannot directly apply the uh, reverse uh, the diffusion process because now the representation of data has been changed. So here the question is that uh, even when you want to generate some kind of the data, uh, which are having the different representations uh, with the, the data that we, are, we use for the training, how we can still utilize the pre-trained uh, diffusion models, uh, which are trained with the, uh, the per pixel the color representation while the representation we are using is the basically the null parameters and the rendering, right? So that's kind of the key part. So since we cannot directly apply the uh, reverse the different process in this case, uh, we are basically designing some kind of the optimization the process using the uh, the, 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 the SDS laws in a way that we can start from some, start from some kind of the, uh, some initial the random kind of the parameters and then, you know, optimize uh, the all the prompters uh, using the backpropagation. So that's kind of a key idea. So this means that like this idea can be applied to some kind of the many other the cases. For example, like when you train the vision models with some kind of the data, with some kind of a certain representation, and then you want when you want to generate some kind of the same type of the data, but with some kind of the completely like different representation, then how we can apply the pre-trained vision models then you can apply, use some kind of these SDSD idea in terms of like not running the reverse the process, but starting from some kind of the uh, random initialization and then updating all the parameters using the backpropagation. Uh, so this is really kind of the key idea that we can basically apply the diffusion models for uh, to generate some kind of data in the any arbitrary, some kind of the other representations. Obviously, the quality of the data may not be that good, like compared to the, the data that we are generating using the, uh, the reverse state process. The SDS, the backpropagation is not that perfect. You can see that actually there are some also kind of the, uh, some bad quality outputs when you use the, the, the backpropagation. But this can be kind of the one way that we can uh, utilize uh, the pretty different models when you want to uh, generate the data, which are using basically different representations. So one of the examples for this, uh, not only for the NERP, but for the other kind of things uh, that can be rendered into the images is the vector images. So this is also one of the examples that uh, now we want to generate some kind of the vector images uh, using the stable diffusion, for example. Then the thing is that now here, the images that we want to generate should be represented as the kind of the SVG format. It's some kind of the vector image the representation. Uh, which is different with the pixel level, the color information, right? So here, what we can do is that we can also apply the same the SDS loss in terms of like starting from some kind of the uh, random initialization and then basically you know, updating all the parameters in terms of like making some final the rendered images, uh, which basically rendering become some kind of the real, realistic images. So this is the kind of the main idea uh, when we want to basically generate some kind of the outputs in the different representations without some kind of the uh, like you know, 
you know, training the diffusion model from the scratch for the new representation. Uh, is this clear? Any question? Yeah, actually this idea has been quite effective in terms of making some very high quality, some 3D outputs. And as you can see, these are really very interesting, the outputs. So, you know, even when you, you know, increase the skill of the 3D the model, the data set, it would be really hard to imagine this kind of the, some outputs, like having a pig wearing a, a backpack or some kind of the ghost eating some kind of the hamburger, like those kind of things. It's really hard to expect to have this kind of the variety of the 3D models, even when you scale up all the 3D data set. But for the images, we are having the more than 5 billion images. So we can consider making this kind of some very random the outputs using the SDS loss. So this is kind of the power of like utilizing some kind of the 2D, uh, the, the information, 2D priors, uh, which is already learned in some kind of the image diffusion models. So this has been very effective the ideas in terms of like making lots of these some interesting some 3D the outputs. And there are also tons of some kind of the follow up the ideas in terms of like how we can also uh, improve the quality of the outputs. So Magic 3D is also one of the kind of the uh, improvement in terms of like having the two stage kind of the pipeline, like having some kind of the course, the, the output from the uh, first stage using the SDS and then converting this the uh, course output into the match first and basically adding the texture using the some kind of the same the SDS the idea. Uh, so you can see that actually the quality has been improved with this kind of some uh, some engineering some kind of techniques. And actually the one of the authors of like this work, the Magic 3D is Jun Gao, who is gonna uh, give the uh, the special the guest lecture uh, next week. So Jun Gao will also be able to uh, give some kind of the more of the ideas about like his recent work about how we can also scale up and also improve the quality of the 3D uh, content generation. Uh, so he's gonna uh, talk about this uh, next Wednesday. And you can also try the uh, the dream fusion the idea yourself. There are also kind of the many of the existing code uh, that you can easily download and just test and see how much it works. And also, uh, if you recall the our the program media assignments, actually there are some kind of the two optional uh, the assignments the assignments the assignment four and the five. So actually, if you go uh, into this kind of optional the assignments, you can also try to basically. Uh, you know, try with the kind of the, the stable diffusion and the NERP studio and basically trying to, to like run the dream fusion, the ideas uh, using the SDS uh, yourself. But obviously there are also kind of the limitations of the dream fusion as well. Uh, so typically if you want to, actually there are some of the cases that the, the NERP reconstruction uh, does not converge. Uh, actually for some, quite many cases, you can see that actually the SDS is not the you know, perfect tool that can really always uh, make some kind of realistic 3D outputs, but sometimes there are also some of the cases that uh, the SDS loss is not converting well, uh, making some kind of the empty outputs. Uh, so to make some kind of the some results, typically we need to uh, use some big, the very high weight uh, for the classify free guidance uh, in terms of like getting some kind of the mode collapse the results, uh, but which also means that we cannot get some kind of the uh, many the diversity for most of the cases. So if you just play with the code, then you can also see how much of this kind of the, the parameters are basically affecting the final the outputs. And there's also some kind of the idea in terms of like how we can also improve the during fusion. Uh, actually, there are lots of the very recent work. So this is like one of the examples in terms of like not making like one the, the outputs, one 3D the generation the outputs, but making some multiple these 3D generation the outputs. And based on that, we are also fine tuning different models using the rural techniques that we discussed, and then basically refining the 3D generation. So there are uh, lots of this kind of some kind of the engineering the uh, kind of techniques uh, in terms of improving the 3D generation. Okay, so these are some kind of the ideas of the 3D generation. Uh, do you have any questions? Why is it okay to use high guidance this skill? Uh, actually, in terms of like getting some kind of realistic images, it's not good to use the uh, high weight for the classified free guidance. But the thing is that as we basically uh, increase the weight uh, for the classified free guidance, actually we are basically uh, sort of like intending the mode collapse in terms of like we want to make the diffusion the model to produce some certain uh, type of the object actually reducing the diversity in terms of that the 
the guidance from the multiple reviews can basically converge into some very specific the single the object. For example, like if you make some kind of the 3D objects like delicious the hamburger, there can be tons of the way that we can make some kind of the hamburger 3D shapes, right? The hamburger images. But basically, we are just increasing the classified fake guidance the weight in terms of that the diffusion model is really just pushing to the some a specific uh this way the, the some of the, the object uh in terms of that the multi the guidance can uh converge well. So this is kind of some very engineering trick. Uh, but then obviously the thing is that the output of the images may not be that realistic. So as you can see, uh, actually the typical the outputs of the, the dream fusion the pipeline is making some kind of the unrealistic some of the appearance, like which is resulted from like using the high weight for the classified free guidance, but that also helps to basically converge well, not getting into some kind of some very empty or some kind of random the outputs. So there are some kind of the pros and the cons in terms of controlling the weight. Any other questions? So yeah, this is the end of our discussion for the 3D generation. And then for the next couple of the weeks, except for the gas lecture, we're gonna uh, switch our gear in terms of like, uh, not only discussing the 3D generation, but also about some of the ideas about like 3D data, the processing, like the segmentation, all the things. Uh, so how are we gonna basically handle the 3D data in terms of like applying, uh, doing some kind of the, applying those kind of data for some kind of applications like, uh, some detection, like segmentation for some more the perceptual kind of the, the tasks. So that's what we are going to discuss uh, from the next week. And if you have any questions about like 3D generation, please uh, let me know. Please post the questions on this slide. And for the uh, last the five minutes, I'm going to quickly share some of the tips for your the project. Uh, so I guess you might also uh, be spending lots of the time for your the project. And we are having how many weeks do we have? Like two or three weeks until the due date of the projects. So yeah, now might be really time to basically push for your the project. So I just want to quickly share some of the tips that I want to say uh, for your the projects. Especially there might be some of the cases for the many of the undergraduate students uh, who might be uh, having the first time to do this kind of the course project uh, for kind of especially for some kind of neural net based kind of things. So the first thing that I want to basically say is that uh, for your the project, the crucial thing is to basically making the output of the, your experiments to be predictable as much as, as the possible, right? I mean, this is really a difficult thing, right? Uh, especially for many kind of the, some neural net implementation, you know, for many kind of things in the neural net, there is nothing guaranteed, right? Uh, many parts of the neural net kind of thing is basically not mathematically guaranteed, uh, which means that for most of the cases, actually, we don't know what sort of the outputs that we're gonna get. Right? But actually, the key thing in terms of like uh, having the successful the outputs in the many neural net based the project is to still uh, make the output of the, all the experiments to be uh, predictable as much as, as the possible. Right? So kind of a tip. Uh, so I'm not saying that this is the only way that you can get some kind of good results, but kind of the some tips for the beginners uh, doing this kind of project is that I'd like to recommend you to start from some kind of the working code and try to make some kind of the small modification uh, in a kind of the incremental way. So that's why actually we also you know, uh, encouraged everyone to basically make some kind of the baseline the work and see how the baseline, the method is basically working uh, with some kind of code and try to basically miss, make some kind of the incremental the build up uh, from the, this kind of the baseline the code. So that's basically uh, what we are basically recommending. So you know, starting, like, start from some kind of the working code that you see, you can see that the code is really working and try to make some kind of the small the modification in a kind of the incremental way, in a way that when you, you know, see some kind of the, some problems in your the code, then you should be able to basically see exactly which component is making the issue, right? So if you basically make some kind of a bigger the framework, uh, at the end of the day, you're gonna say that like the code is not working and I don't know uh, where the code, the problem is coming from, right? So, so you need to basically make, uh, should be able to basically manage the code in terms of like, you know, when you, you know, you know, when you add some like this small the component, if you see that like this, you know, this addition is making some kind of problems, then you can basically spot that you know, this is the place which is making some of the issues, right? 
So you should be able to basically uh, manage the code in terms of like uh, having some of the ideas, like which component is really making some of the issues when the code is not working. Uh, so this is really crucial part in terms of like uh, making the whole the process to be like the trackable and seeing like what is the kind of the part which is making some of the issues. And I'd like to really emphasize that for many kind of uh, the project, uh, especially for especially for these neural net projects, basically the devil is in the details, right? So any kind of the small the mistake, very tiny mistake that you are making can really break the whole the system, the whole the pipeline. For example, like when you basically somehow change some small parameters in the activation layer, what kind of learning rate, whatever kind of things, uh, when you make some kind of the very tiny the, the, the changes uh, in your the system, that can really break the whole the pipeline, right? Uh, so, and also the thing is that even when you see some many kind of the papers, Basically, any kind of the papers and the code repository do not explain that much about like which details are really important uh, for the performance. So you are the people that you should be able to see like you know what's kind of the crucial details, uh, which is really affecting a lot in the final the outputs. So that's why it's really important to make some kind of the incremental the build up uh, in terms of like making some small changes every time and seeing like which small change is really making some difference in the outputs. So try to make the whole the project to be tractable in terms like uh, which detail is really making some of the you know which the changes. And for that also the crucial thing is to you know make some kind of the fast iterations. So which means that if you basically add some kind of the you know, small the improvement or the small changes in the pipeline, uh, you will basically need to uh, repeat this process multiple times, basically accumulating all the small changes into the pipelines, right? And this will basically take will take some lots of the time, uh, basically repeating like adding some kind of small components. So the also the key thing is that you need to make each step, each cycle like adding some small component to be, uh, you know, fast as much as possible. So which means that you know if, if the training of the all the network like takes like two days with the entire the benchmark, and if you try to make some kind of the small improvement like every two days, it will take like very long time, right? So here also the key thing is like how we can basically uh, reduce the time for of the each of the cycle in terms of that you can basically you know run some you know, multiple the cycles you know, as much as the possible. So reduce the reducing the time uh, to run each of the cycle, basically running the training and the test as much as possible is also the key thing. So for that you will basically need to make some kind of design some kind of the toy experiments. So I recommend not to run your code uh, with the entire the benchmark from the very beginning, but start to basically run your code with some kind of the very small the uh, toy experiment setup and basically check whether your code is really working or not. And then start to basically run all the things with some kind of the uh, some larger the data set. So for example, like one of the ideas like making some kind of the toy experiments might be basically, uh, for example, like reducing the training the data size. If you have the training data with the like, for example, like 10,000 uh, the three models or the images, then you can actually just try to basically uh, train your code with the much smaller scale of the data set, even like 10% or the 1%, 0.1%, even just like, you know, sometimes you might just need to see whether your code is really just like working with even with the single the, the data point. There are really some cases that you just need to check whether your the, the neural network is just like overfitting to be some simple, uh, very small the scale of the data set. So just try to uh, reduce all the training and the data the, the set size in a way that you can basically make some kind of the, uh, the, the easier the setup to check all the kind of the problems. And you can also try to simplify the data or the problems as well. And also I recommend you to basically modulize uh, the whole the pipeline. So if you basically combine some kind of the multiple the components in the framework, obviously you need to basically like, you know, you know, split the whole the pipeline to the small the components and also check the you know whether each of the components is working in your design the, the pipeline. So modularization is also the key thing uh, in terms of designing some kind of the toy experiments. Right? And also when you are collaborating with some kind of the multiple the team members, uh, there can be also obviously the multiple way to basically collaborate. Uh, you can do some kind of a pair programming, like work all together. But typically, this is not that easy, right? Uh, obviously, you know, you can, you know, work with your the the, the teammates in terms of like you know, checking your code like line by line all together. So that's kind of feasible, but but for many of the cases, it's not that kind of easy. 
So then you might need to consider basically how you're gonna basically split the tasks. And also in terms of like making the collaboration, also the key thing is that uh, it's better not to make some kind of the dependencies across the tasks that you are doing. So try to think, so actually it takes some time. So it's not the kind of the easy, simple the task. You need to also spend some time to like think about how you're gonna basically uh, remove the dependencies of course the task you're basically you know, uh, distributing to the, into each of the team members in terms of that uh, when you do something uh, for the task A, then the other people can also do something else uh, in parallel uh, simultaneously uh, without any kind of making the dependencies. And also if you make the dependencies of course the tasks of like different the team members, when you have some kind of issues, then you don't know whether the issue is coming from the task that you, has been done by the team member A or for the task that has been done by the team member B, right? So making some more of the complexities. So here basically all the key thing is basically modularizing everything, modularizing the components and modularizing the tasks uh, for each of the team member in terms of like removing all the dependencies and see where we are basically having some kind of issues and also running everything in parallel. So that's kind of also the key thing. And also, you know, think about basically how your project will be basically evaluated and both in the qualitatively and the quantitatively. So you might also need to show some kind of some quantitative measures like the tables and some kind of the graphs and the plots. And also you might also need to provide some kind of the qualitative outputs on the images and 3D models, right? Uh, so for each of the step, for every single step, uh, making some of the progress in your project, I strongly recommend you to check out both the qualitative and also the quantitative outputs. You need to also check the both the numbers and also up the images as well. And for that, actually, also I strongly recommend you to take some time to uh, make some kind of the good visualization the tools. I think we can also share some of the tools for the visualization. Uh, but also checking uh, the outputs visually is also very crucial things uh, in terms of like making your the project be successful. Uh, so you might also need to spend some time to basically have some kind of the good uh, visualization the tools. So you might also need to make some kind of very special the visualization tools for uh, each of the tasks in your the projects. So having the good visualization tool is also very crucial. And actually this might be the most important part. So you need to know that actually at the end of like all these kinds of things, your the projects will be evaluated uh, based on your the poster presentation and also the report, uh, rather than that just the code that you're putting in your the GitHub repository, right? So actually making really good poster and also the report and having really good the poster presentation will be really, really important and it's for the ERD variation. So to get the good score from the peer reviews, I actually recommend you to basically start to prepare the report and the poster now. So as you spend more time to basically polish all the things in the report and the poster, uh, we will be able to get some kind of the better quality, not only for the URD results, but also for the URD report and the poster. Uh, so that will be also the very crucial things. Actually, there will also be many cases in the previous uh, the, the, the semesters in terms of that, like many students like, spend lots of the time to get the really good quality of the older results, uh, but they didn't have enough time to make some kind of good post and the report. And they couldn't get some really good Core because when people see their the post and the report, it didn't look good in terms of the quality of the older things, writing older things. But actually, it turns out actually they spent lots of time to get really kind of best quality, but it didn't appear well. I mean, it didn't be like it wasn't that demonstrated well in terms of their define the output. So think about how you can also spend some time for the post and the report. And I think you need to allocate at least like one full week at the very minimum in terms of like, you know, uh, preparing the report and the poster. So that's also crucial things. And for the evaluation, we already posted all the review guidelines in our the course web page. So please check out all the details there. And also this is basically describing how your the project will be evaluated, right? And also the key thing is that for this kind of the course projects, basically there is no way that we can make some kind of the apple to apple the comparison. So everything is basically all about like how much you can persuade your the peer reviewers, basically the reviewers like including me and the TAs and your the peer the uh, reviewer the, the students. So it's all the matter of like how much you can basically persuade your the reviewers with some kind of your the outputs in the post and the report. So think about how you're gonna basically persuade your the outputs with some kind of the uh, some convincing the outputs and some kind of the logics that you're having on your the project. And the last part is that uh, actually, as I also mentioned at the beginning of this course, 
we are very recommended to utilize any kind of AI tools, uh, both for the coding and also the report writing. So even I recommend you to just use ChatGPT, uh, whatever the AI, AI tools. There is no reason not to use this kind of AI tools for now. So try to maximize, uh, utilize like this kind of so all the tools that you can use. But this does not mean that you can just like copy any kind of code, text, or features, whatever kind of things from the any other the place uh, from the some kind of the citations, right? So if you basically copy text, figures, whatever kind of things without any citations in your either the report and the poster, you will get zero score. So please uh, be aware that you know, you know, this is really kind of you know, uh, important matter in terms of like, you, know, you should really avoid like just you know, uh, you know, the place of reason, basically copying things from the, any other the places. But if you basically need to basically use some code in the other repositories, or if you want to copy some of the figures or something, even for the comparisons, even for some kind of comparisons, if you need to basically bring some of the text and figures from the other the, the places, uh, even from the, uh, including the, ba the baseline the paper, you need to very clearly cite them, both in the poster and the report, in terms of that the readers can see, like these are the parts that the submitters implemented or just wrote, or these are some parts that they basically just brought from the other places. So having the proper the citation in case like when you, you know, bring some kind of things from the other places is the most important part to avoid the plot reason. So in the last three cases, like actually we have some quite few cases like that we are basically detecting this kind of the plagiarism issues and they got zero scores. So this is really important kind of matter. So we also have some kind of the all the kind of the some details in our the, the course webpage in terms of like how we're gonna basically uh, check out all this kind of some academic misconduct and how this will basically affect your degrading. So these are some of the guidelines and the tips for the projects. Do you have any questions on this? Cool. So we're going to also have the office hour today at the 7 p.m. Uh, so if you have any things that you want to discuss about your projects, uh, feel free to drop by my office and we can chat about your projects. And then we are not going to have the class on this Wednesday and we're going to resume uh, next Monday with some kind of the new topic, not about 3D generation, about, about, about the 3D data processing. So I will see you next Monday. Okay. Thank you.